Lori Dupont knew she was in danger. She turned to the law for protection, but the law wasn't quick enough. The Windsor, Ontario nurse was murdered in the hospital where she worked. Her alleged killer, a doctor at the same hospital. Lori had been on duty in the recovery room of the Hotel Du Hospital in Windsor. It was Saturday, November 12th, 2005. It's a day I'll never forget. For months, a hospital anesthetist, a physician, had been stalking her, phoning her, and leaving threatening messages on her car. That morning, he came to the hospital, armed with a military bayonet, and stabbed her to death. Police found the doctor in his car after the attack. He had injected himself with a lethal substance, and he died three days later. The lives of those who love Lori were changed forever. The lives of every nurse in Ontario changed forever. Lori's mother, Barb, says the family fought for an inquest. The Ministry of Labour was not going to investigate Lori's death because it didn't fall under their mandate. A criminal, a criminal investigation was started by the police department, but they came up against a brick wall because the hospital refused to cooperate. And the hospital was not forthcoming with any information, of course. So we needed answers. Like, I couldn't live the rest of my life not knowing how this tragedy came about. Fighting with them for an inquest was the family of Teresa Vince a Sears employee in Chatham who was shot to death by an infatuated boss in 1996. An inquest into Teresa's murder had recommended consideration of sexual harassment in the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Years later, nothing had happened. And I knew then and there that we had to put every effort possible as Ona, as the advocate for nurses and allied health professionals in Ontario to ensure this never happens again and that we can eradicate violence in our workplaces. Initially, the matter was treated essentially as a matter of domestic violence. And uh, that was the attitude of the hospital, that uh, here are two people who were involved in a personal relationship gone wrong and uh, it was it was just uh, too bad that it happened in the hospital, but that essentially it was a matter of domestic violence. And that's not the way Ona saw it at all. It's, it saw the situation as being one of uh, um, occupational health and safety and an occupational health and safety risk and a workplace fatality. Dr. Peter Jaffe is an expert on domestic violence and testified at the inquest. Here at the Women's Canadian Club in London, he is advocating for action in identifying and responding to domestic violence in the workplace. At the inquest, he counted 84, 84 missed opportunities to intervene to save Lori's life. A note left on uh, Lori's car uh, clearly a warning sign that she was being stalked. Uh, there was incidents uh, in the hospital itself, in the operating room, where inappropriate comments were made um, by the perpetrator, or there was uh, actually bumping up against her, where people had noticed things. So not only words, uh, but also uh, threats, implied threats. Uh, so those are things that really accumulated. So they weren't, I think one of the things uh, that, that certainly is important to emphasize, that these weren't subtle. These weren't things like sometimes people say, well, I'm not sure what he meant or what happened. These were things which were clearly, you know, harassing, abusive, inappropriate, uh, in inappropriate incidents to happen in any, in any workplace. Bill 168 came as a result of the DuPont inquest three years later. The way it's benefited members is both, you've got the legal system, the law has changed, employers are now required to, to um, do risk assessments around violence. They're required to have policies in place to address um, violence. They're required to alert, um, alert um, 
staff to possible violent patients because you've got to understand that violence, while in the DuPont case, came from a coworker, a physician, that the vast majority of violence that is um, experienced by ONUS membership comes from not coworkers, but from patients. But because of the changes to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, all incidents of violence and risks of violence are drawn into that, that system. Lori's story, which led to Bill 168, deeply inspired another young ONA member. Her identity is protected because her case is ongoing. She was represented by ONA when she, like Lori, was harassed by a physician. I felt completely alone and completely unsupported, and I googled, essentially, um, nurse gets killed by physician, and the first article that came up was Laurie DuPont. And I remember printing it off at about 11.30 at night, feeling very alone, like I couldn't talk to anybody anyways, and reading the article, and I felt so connected as though she was my soul sister and I didn't even know her. The Ontario Hospital Association says too often its hands are tied in dealing with disruptive physician behavior. A physician, uh, for example, uh, is granted privileges on an annual basis. And if one wanted to remove those privileges, one first has to go through a meeting of the Medical Advisory Committee, which usually involves lawyers, and then if the physician is unhappy with the recommendation of the Medical Advisory Committee, is then entitled to a full hearing before the board. So this is a full-scale hearing, like a trial, with lawyers, with cross-examination, with court reporters, before a quorum of the board, which might be 10 or 12 people. This can, make, this can take many days. It could take weeks, conceivably, to deal with the issue of a physician's privileges. The process itself is grueling and it's so lengthy and I feel like if it was me I would have been fired. We would have had one arbitration and I would have been given my notice and I would have been fired and I feel like being a physician that they're given many more chances um, to be able to regain privileges. Meanwhile Dr. Jaffe says the passage of Bill 168 isn't enough. So just to assume because the law has passed, everyone's complying is not the reality. You know, you have, there has to be regular audits. You have to make sure, you know, training's in place, people are aware. Uh, so it's not just uh, a law change, but people's attitudes and behavior haven't. Barb McQuarrie conducted training sessions at the hospital after the inquest. We actually need to spell out much more clearly for employers exactly what their obligations are. And those obligations have to be workplace-wide training and education. Um, there is no way that we can address this if we don't understand what we're seeing, if we don't understand warning signs, if we don't understand risk factors. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to staffing, doesn't it? Um, you know, because the nature of the client population that nurses deal with not only in the uh, mental health uh, units and facilities out there, but on the emergency departments in virtually every area, people present risks and, you know, people present risk of violence. And to effectively deal with that, you need training, you need response mechanisms, but you need adequate staff to respond. After the passage of Bill 168, Barb DuPont, Lori's mother, stopped giving interviews. She made this interview with Ona her final exception. I just, I felt I had to do it as much as I didn't want to. I wanted people to be aware of the positives that can come out of a tragedy. And um, much of what I did came from anger at Lori's death, mainly anger at the hospital for their attitude, which was one of victim blaming and refusing to acknowledge any accountability on their part. I mean, Lori DuPont faced something horrific, and to me, what came out of that, I mean, you know, I think it's important for her loved ones to know that while this tragedy happened, that things are coming out of her situation 
to prevent it from happening again. You know, just one person out there can make such a difference. They can, um, they can just break that terrible chain of events that can lead to death.